In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. The opening sentence of The Hobbit is one of the most famous first sentences in all of literature. Simple and short, like its subject, it ignites the imagination the moment we read it. What on earth and in its comfortable hole in the earth is a hobbit? Unlike orcs, elves, dwarves, wizards and trolls, all of which Tolkien had trawled from the deep cauldron of myth, which is the common inheritance of the civilised imagination, hobbits were apparently entirely new, springing forth as an imaginative fruit from the fertile soul of the author. Hello, I'm Joseph Pierce, and welcome to Bilbo's Journey. When one thinks of hobbits, one thinks of the juxtaposition of home and habit, or even rabbit, considering their burrowed homes and their large furry feet. We feel very much at home in their presence because the hobbits are very close to home. Bilbo Baggins bears a remarkable resemblance to each of us, his diminutive size and furry feet notwithstanding. He seeks the respectable life, he likes tea and toast and jam and pickles. He has wardrobes full of clothes and lots of pantries full of food. He is a creature of comfort dedicated to the creature comforts. Nothing could be further from Bilbo Baggins' mind or further from his desire than the prospect or the threat of an adventure. In Christian terms, Bilbo Baggins is dedicated to the easy life and would find the prospect of taking up his cross and following the heroic path of self-sacrifice utterly anathema. The unexpected party at the beginning of the story, in which the daily habits of the Hobbit are disrupted by the arrival of unwelcome guests, is therefore a necessary disruption. It is the intervention into his cosy life of an element of inconvenience or suffering which serves as a wake-up call and a call to action. Gandalf introduces the reluctant Bilbo to Thorin Oakenshield and the other dwarves in order to prompt him into an adventure, the purpose of which is ostensibly the recovery of the dwarves' treasure, but also on the moral level at which the story works the growth in wisdom and virtue through suffering and sacrifice of Bilbo himself. The wizard's unexpected arrival is connected to his desire to wake Bilbo up from his cosy slumbers. But in so doing, he also wakes us up from ours. He wishes to send Bilbo on an adventure because, as he informs the Hobbit, it will be very good for you and profitable too, very likely, if you ever get over it. Bilbo is not convinced. He tells Gandalf that he has no use for adventures which are uncomfortable things. We are plain, quiet folk, and I have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. I can't think when anybody sees in them. Good morning. We don't want any adventures here, thank you. You might try over the hill or across the water. By this he meant that the conversation was at an end. Little does he know it, but the fact that adventures are uncomfortable is the very reason for their usefulness. Gandalf wants to remove Bilbo from his comfort zone so that the Hobbit can experience reality in its full and expansive richness. Bilbo needs to venture beyond his home, which is an extension of his self, 
in order to experience the truth that is beyond himself and grow in the space that it provides. In short, the purpose of Gandalf's visit is to help Bilbo grow up. Much to the Hobbit's discomfort, it becomes increasingly clear that at Gandalf's behest, the dwarves intend for Bilbo to join them in a perilous quest to liberate treasure from the clutches of a dragon. As Thorin discusses the nature of the quest that they are about to undertake, the motif of the dragon sickness is first established. Dragons steal gold and jewels from man and elves and dwarves, wherever they can find them, and they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever unless they are killed, and never enjoy a brass ring of it. Indeed, they hardly know a good bit of work from a bad, though they usually have a good notion of the current market value. And they can't make a thing for themselves, not even mend a little loose scale of their armor. Thorin's depiction of the dragons of Middle-earth seems uncannily like the description of certain types of people which all of us know in our everyday lives. Those who, like Oscar Wilde's cynic, know the price of everything and the value of nothing. From the start, therefore, the dragons are more than simply dragons. They are also signifiers of a certain attitude to life and to things which is ultimately unhealthy and is rightly considered a sickness. Continuing his exposition on the nature of dragons, Thorin tells Bilbo that dragons also carry away people, especially maidens, to eat. Once again, the fullness of applicable meaning transcends the literal eating of the flesh of maidens. Dragons are not merely hungry, they are wicked. They desire the defilement of the pure and undefiled, the destruction of the virgin. Their devouring is a deflowering. Parallels with human dragons in the world beyond Middle-earth and closer to the home of the reader are not difficult to discern. The war against the dragon is not, therefore, a war against a physical monster like a dinosaur, but a battle against the wickedness we see around us in our everyday lives. We all face our daily dragons, and we must defend ourselves from them and hopefully slay them. The sobering reality is that we must either fight the dragons that we encounter in life or become dragons ourselves. There is no comfortable alternative. This is the reason that the unexpected party at the beginning of The Hobbit becomes the unexpected parting of Bilbo from all the comforts of home. He sets out as the most reluctant pilgrim and adventurer that can be imagined, bemoaning his luck and resenting Gandalf's disruption of his somnambulant existence. It would take many days and a great deal of discomfort before Bilbo would come to realize the truth of Gandalf's words that the adventure would be very good for him and profitable. As Bilbo, Gandalf and the dwarves journey into the Misty Mountains, it seems that their luck had finally deserted them, when all except Gandalf are captured by a party of orcs, 
or goblins as they are called in The Hobbit. We are told by the narrator that goblins are cruel, wicked and bad-hearted and that they make no beautiful things but many clever ones. It is not unlikely that they invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world, especially the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once. For wheels and engines and explosions always delighted them, and also not working with their own hands more than they could help. But in those days, and those wild parts, they had not advanced, as it is called, so far. There is much of Tolkien's own philosophy embedded in the narrator's evident disdain for the goblins which must be understood if you are to understand his work. For Tolkien, echoing the view of the great philosophers, the good, the true and the beautiful are inextricably interwoven. In Christian terms, their unity and inseparability is itself a reflection of the Trinity, who is the source of all goodness, truth and beauty. This being so, those who are cruel, wicked and bad-hearted will not make good, true or beautiful things. The fact that goblins make clever things indicates that intelligence is not a guarantor of goodness, nor is it necessarily a means of finding the truth. Intelligence can be used in the service of cruelty or wickedness, or in the weaving of lies, or in the service of a host of other sins. In the absence of virtue and wisdom, intelligence becomes a servant of evil. It is poisoned. The fact that goblins don't like working with their hands more than they can help illustrates their preference for technology and its labour-saving devices over the traditional craftsmanship that takes delight in the work of their hands and its products. Compare the goblins' dislike of craftsmanship and art with the delight that the elves, hobbits and dwarves take in such things. Finally, the sardonic irony of the parenthetical comment on so-called advanced societies indicates Tolkien's scepticism about the benefits of technological progress. Compare the narrator's condemnation of goblins in The Hobbit with the relative simplicity and sanity of the hobbits of the Shire, as described in the prologue to The Lord of the Rings. Hobbits like peace and quiet and good tilled earth. A well-ordered and well-farmed countryside was their favourite haunt. They do not and did not understand or like machines more complicated than a forge bellows, a water mill or a hand loom, though they were skillful with tools. After we have made the comparison between the malicious and destructive cleverness of the goblins and the gentle and genteel simplicity of the hobbits, we will perceive that the conflict in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings between those who serve the shadow and those who walk in the light, between trolls, goblins and dragons on the one side and hobbits, dwarves and elves on the other, is a battle between two civilizations: the culture of death and the culture of life, which is closer to home than we might at first realise. Yet whether his readers realise it or not, it is abundantly clear that Tolkien understood that his stories were applicable to the world in which his readers lived. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings were imaginative images of the real world and held up a mirror to their readers, allowing them to see their own struggles reflected in the stories. After Bilbo and the dwarves are liberated from the clutches of the goblins by Gandalf's timely intervention, they flee through the subterranean tunnels deep beneath the Misty Mountains, pursued by a host of goblins intent on avenging the death of their leader, whom Gandalf had slain. In the panic and confusion, Bilbo falls from the back of the dwarf Dory, who has been carrying him as they fled. He is knocked unconscious, and awakes some time later in the pitch dark 
and utterly alone. He feels his way crawling on the ground. Till suddenly his hand met what felt like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. He put the ring into his pocket, almost without thinking. Certainly it did not seem of any particular use at the moment. At that moment, alone and in the dark, and lost in an orc-infested labyrinth, Bilbo has more important things to worry about. In the utter darkness in which he finds himself, he stumbles on doggedly and almost hopelessly, going down, down into the lowest depths of the subterranean labyrinth. Suddenly, he splashes into icy cold water, he has come to a lake that never saw the light of day, in which there dwelt old Gollum, a small, slimy creature as dark as darkness, except for two big, round, pale eyes in his thin face. Gollum suggests that they play a game of high-stakes riddling, in which Gollum agrees to show the Hobbit the way out of the labyrinth if Bilbo wins, but that the Hobbit will be eaten by Gollum should Bilbo lose. The contest is therefore literally a matter of life and death for the hapless Hobbit, who has little choice but to comply with Gollum's offer. After the exchange of several riddles, Gollum asks a riddle that seems to have Bilbo beaten. Alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking, all in mail, never clinking. <laughs> Sensing victory, Gollum begins to climb from his boat to get at Bilbo and claim his edible prize. As he places his foot in the water, a frightened fish jumps from the lake and lands on Bilbo's toes. The hobbit takes the providential hint and shouts out the answer with great relief. Fish, fish, he cries, it is fish. Although the providential hint could be seen as Bilbo's good luck, it should be noted that Gollum's own bad luck is his own fault. If he had behaved fairly and virtuously and had not stepped from the boat in his uncharitable haste to claim his prize, Bilbo would never have received the saving hint. Gandalf's words in The Lord of the Rings that hatred often hurts itself and Theoden's epigram that oft evil will shall evil mar are proven correct yet again. Fortune is not only biased in favour of the virtuous, rewarding their merits, it is also biased against the wicked, allowing them to destroy themselves through their own malevolent actions. Having answered Bilbo's next riddle, Gollum asks another hard riddle that has the Hobbit flummoxed. This thing all things devours. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers, gnaws, iron, bites, steel, grinds hard stones to meal, slays kings, ruins towns, and beats high mountain down. <laughs> go, go. For the second time, Gollum senses victory, and for the second time, his impatience gets the better of him. 
As Bilbo struggles for the solution, Gollum again gets out of his boat and paddles towards Bilbo. Hearing the splashing of his adversary's progress towards him, the hobbit panics. He wants to shout out, give me more time, give me time. But his tongue seems to cleave to his palate and all that actually comes out with a sudden squeal is time, time. Bilbo is saved by pure luck, the narrator tells us, because time was of course the answer. The Hobbit is saved in the nick of time by a power beyond time itself, but with the unwitting assistance of Gollum's own evil actions. Having ridden his luck in the riddling contest, Bilbo, with the help of the newly acquired ring, escapes from Gollum's clutches. Initially, he feels that he must kill Gollum in order to make good his escape. And yet, his conscience troubles him. It would not be a fair fight. He is invisible and has an unfair advantage. He is also armed with a sword, whereas Gollum is unarmed. Apart from these questions of fairness or justice, there is also the question of pity or mercy towards Gollum, who is miserable, alone, lost. sudden understanding, a pity mixed with horror welled up in Bilbo's heart, a glimpse into endless unmarked days without light or hope of betterment, hard stone, cold fish, sneaking and whispering. All these thoughts passed in a flash of a second. The moral and practical importance of this act of pity and mercy is made clear by Gandalf, ever the voice of wisdom, in response to Frodo's exclamation that it was a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had the chance. Pity? Yes, it was pity, stayed his hand, pity and mercy, not to strike without need. And he has been well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure that he took so little hurt of the evil and escaped in the end, because he began his ownership of the ring so, with pity. Gandalf explains to Frodo that the fate of the whole quest to destroy the ring depended on Bilbo's passing of this primary test of virtue. My heart tells me that Gollum has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end. And when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, yours not least. Gandalf's words are those of a prophet. When Frodo on Mount Doom fails through the power of his own will to overcome the more powerful evil of the ring, he is saved by the timely intervention of Gollum. An intervention which would not have been possible if Bilbo had killed that vile creature when he had a chance. Thus we are reminded that it is not simply evil actions that have consequence, but that acts of virtue have consequences also. The economy of grace that rules the cosmos ensures that virtue is ultimately rewarded as surely as it ensures that vice is ultimately punished. Gandalf's parting advice to Bilbo and the dwarves before he leaves them is that their success will depend on your luck and on your courage and sense. We know that luck is a euphemism for the presence of a providence that rewards virtue and punishes vice whereas the necessity of courage and sense indicates the role of free will to the success or failure of the quest. Nothing is guaranteed. The future depends on faith and hope in the power of providence combined with virtuous action. On the other hand, a fall into folly could lead to failure. 
This is made clear by Gandalf's last words of advice before he departs. Be good, take care of yourselves, and don't leave the path. Here we see Gandalf as the archetypal father figure, advising his children as they embark on a journey on which he cannot be present to watch over them, that they should be good, be careful, and don't do anything stupid. The advice is, however, charged with Christian moral guidance, which the everyday language might obscure if we are not paying due attention. Being good, i.e. virtuous, is the prerequisite for success, whereas taking care implies the need to practice the cardinal virtues of prudence and temperance. Most importantly, the emphatic exhortation that they should not under any circumstances leave the path reminds the Christian of the words of Christ. Enter ye in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many are they that go in thereat. In spite of such emphatic and unequivocal advice, Bilbo and the dwarves leave the path as soon as the pinch of hunger begins to hurt and as soon as the sound of elven feasting in the distance, lit by a welcoming light, beckons them. Ignoring the wizard's warning, they all left the path and plunged into the forest together. Bilbo, separated from the rest of the party, is attacked by a giant spider and is forced to defend himself. He strikes the spider in its eyes with the sword and with a further stroke of his blade, kills it. Somehow, the killing of the giant spider, all alone, by himself, in the dark, without the help of the wizard or the dwarves or of anybody else, made a great difference to Mr. Baggins. He felt a different person and much fiercer and bolder in spite of an empty stomach as he wiped his sword on the grass and put it back into its sheath. Bilbo has come of age. He has become something more than he was before. He has grown up. The vanquishing of the monster, all alone in the dark, without the help of the wizard, is a rite of passage. Perhaps, we begin to surmise, this was at least part of the reason for Gandalf's departure. As a father figure, the wizard realises, as all fathers and other guardians must, that the bird can only become fully what it is meant to be by being made to fly the nest. As God himself gave our first parents the freedom to go astray by giving them freedom itself, we must let our own little hobbits loose so they can learn the lessons that life must teach if they are to grow into the fullness of whom they are meant to be. Gandalf, as a model of true guardianship, teaches Bilbo with his words and by his example conveying in his actions the wisdom and virtue necessary to fly the nest without falling. As with Frodo in the later book, Bilbo in The Hobbit is in some ways an everyman figure who shows us ourselves or, perhaps more importantly, shows us who we ought to be. The Hobbit calls all of its readers to grow up. This is a lesson that is important for children but is equally important for adults who are having difficulty being grown-ups. Bilbo's tests of virtue are as applicable to his readers on their journey through life as they are applicable to Bilbo himself. His journey is our journey, and the lessons that he learns are lessons that we are also meant to learn. As Gandalf might say to each of us, I can put it no plainer, than by saying that Bilbo is meant to grow up and that you are meant to grow up also.
Upon their arrival at Lake Town, having escaped from the Elven Palace, Thorin and his company of dwarves are treated like kings by the common people. This is not surprising because their return was prophesied in legends that had become folklore. Thorin had spoken magical words into the ears of those who heard them when he declared himself to be Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thror, king under the mountain. I have come back. As news spreads of the legendary king's return, the people of Lake Town begin to sing old songs concerning the return of the king under the mountain. The king beneath the mountains, the king of carven stone, the lord of silver fountains shall come into his own. His crown shall be upholden, his harp shall be restrung. His hall shall echo golden to songs of yore sung. The woods shall wave on mountains and grass beneath the sun. His wealth shall flow in fountains and the rivers golden run. The stream shall run in gladness, the lake shall shine and burn. All sorrow, fail and sadness at the mountain king's return. Clearly, there is a potent and palpable parallel between the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings in this shared theme of the return of the king. And yet, apart from their shared kingship and the fact that both kings returned from exile to claim their rightful inheritance, it seems that Aragorn and Thorin could not be more different. Aragorn's character and kingship are marked not only with great courage and martial prowess, but with meekness and humility, and ultimately, with the miraculous and Christ-like healing power that he shows in the paths of the dead and the houses of healing. Thorin, by comparison, is grumpy and obstreperous and falls into the destructive dragon sickness. Aragorn appears to be a paragon of kingly virtue, worthy of respect, reverence and emulation. Thorin, on the other hand, seems tainted by pride and greed, and serves as a cautionary image of vice and its harmful consequences. Such differences should not, however, distract us from the importance of kingship, nor from the importance of the king's return, which is clearly a matter for rejoicing in both books. Tolkien, as a Catholic and as a medievalist, drew deep drafts of inspiration from his understanding of true kingship, particularly as manifested by legendary and historical examples of exiled kings who return to claim their rightful inheritance. King Arthur is the once and future king of popular legend who hasn't really died but is only sleeping. He will return, so it is believed, in a time of great peril to deliver England from her enemies. In the highest sense, the return of the king signifies the second coming of Christ the King at the end of the long defeat of history. This is the ultimate return from exile of the true king to claim his own. Thorin is certainly a pathetic figure when placed beside Aragorn or Christ, but his true kingship is not in doubt, nor is the joy of the people at his prophesied return. Like Aragorn, he has come to reclaim that which is rightfully his, 
the dragon, Smaug, the enemy which Thorin must defeat, is a usurper who is squatting illegitimately on the throne of Thorin's kingdom, claiming its gold, silver and jewels as his own. Having no legitimate right to the riches of the king's realm, the dragon has seized it by force. There he squats, Smaug the Smug, confident in possession of his ill-gotten gains and heedless of the songs that men sing about the return of the king. It is clear, therefore, in the lesser of Tolkien's two tales, as much as in the greater, that the return of the king is as necessary for the restoration of justice. As the unfolding of the plot reveals, dragon sickness is not restricted to dragons. Apart from Bilbo's own affliction with it, the dwarves are clearly driven by their desire to regain the treasure and Thorin becomes utterly possessed by his obsession with hoarding it for himself once the dragon is slain. His heart is poisoned by his possessive gold lust, and he forgets his friendship with Bilbo and the debt that he owes to him in the hardness and blindness which the dragon sickness causes. We are told that dragons have no real use for all their wealth, but they know it to an ounce as a rule, especially after long possession. As with the clever inventions of the orcs, which we discussed earlier, the obsessive possessiveness of dragons is closer to home than we might at first realize. The dragon sickness is applicable to people whom we might know in our own lives, or perhaps it might even be applicable to ourselves, as a euphemism for the rampant materialism of our consumerist culture. Smaug's fury at the loss of a single insignificant and practically useless trinket serves as a metaphor for modern man and his mania for possessing trash that he doesn't need. As if to make sure that we don't miss the applicable point, the narrator compares Smaug's rage with that of many people in the world today. Smaug stirred and stretched forth his neck to sniff. Then he missed the cup. Thieves, fire, murder. Such a thing had not happened since first he came to the mountain. His rage passes description. The sort of rage that is only seen when rich folk that have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but never before used or wanted. For Tolkien, dragons are not mere figments of the imagination. On the contrary, imaginary dragons are found in his story because real dragons are found in history. Real dragons are not like dinosaurs, which are purely natural creatures, such as whales or elephants, but preternatural creatures like angels or demons. In fact, dragons in Christian iconography and Christian legend are always demonic. They are never merely big, like a Tyrannosaurus rex, but evil, like the devil himself. Thus, depictions in art of St. Michael's vanquishing the devil often portray Satan as dragon-like. Similarly, the story of St. George and the dragon is ultimately about the saint's conquest of Satan, not about a noble warrior's conquest of a large and dangerous beast. For Christians, and let's not forget that Tolkien was a lifelong practicing Catholic, the devil and his demons are real. They are part of the supernatural fabric of reality. The presence of the dragon in Tolkien's work shows us a real creature, the devil, 
in a way that it is easier to see than is sometimes possible in our own cluttered and myopic lives. In showing us the dragon which is wasting fairyland, Tolkien is showing us the devil who is trying to waste our own souls and those of all men. The destruction of Smaug is in many ways the climactic moment of the plot of The Hobbit, in much the same way as the destruction of the Ring is the climactic moment in The Lord of the Rings. In both books, however, the destruction of the evil thing, be it the dragon or the ring, does not destroy even itself. In the latter book, the Shire must still be scoured and Sharky, the shriveled remnant of Saruman, must be confronted. Similarly, in The Hobbit, the death of the dragon does not lead to the healing of the dragon sickness. On the contrary, the dragon's removal seems to accentuate the evil effects of the sickness in the dwarves and in Thorin in particular. The portent of such a problem is given by Tolkien in the very title of the chapter that follows the one in which Smaug is killed. Far from peace and prosperity returning, as we might have expected, the chapter is called the Gathering of the Clouds, signifying a coming storm. Furthermore, the allusive suggestion to the Gathering of the Clans, which could be seen as implicit in the choice of title, suggests that the storm that is approaching is the storm of battle. After the battle, Bilbo is reconciled with the mortally wounded and contrite Thorin who, healed of the dragon sickness, wishes to part in friendship and to apologise for his earlier words and deeds. Bilbo knelt on one knee, filled with sorrow. Farewell, King Under the Mountain, he said. This is a bitter adventure if it must end so, and not a mountain of gold can amend it. Yet I am glad that I have shared in your perils. That has been more than any Baggins deserves. No, said Thorin. There is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom, blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. Much of the Christian morality of The Hobbit is conveyed in this final conciliatory exchange between Bilbo Baggins of the Shire and Thorin Oakenshield, the king under the mountain. The adventure has been bitter in so far as it ends in death, and no amount of material wealth can compensate for the loss of life. And yet Bilbo would rather have shared in the deadly perils of his friend, even in an adventure that ends so bitterly, than have stayed at home in the comfort of the Shire. In this embrace of suffering, even unto death, Bilbo is encapsulating the whole idea of life being a cross that we are called to carry willingly and indeed enthusiastically. Life is not about the pursuit of creature comforts and taking the paths of least resistance. It is about love, which can be defined as willingly laying down our lives for others. In leaving the comfort of the Shire, our own space and comfort zone, and embracing the suffering of the many crosses that the adventure of life places in our path, and in giving ourselves willingly in the service of others, we grow in virtue, which is the only growth in stature that matters. Having experienced the adventure to the full, Bilbo is not only glad of all the pain and sorrow, but feels himself unworthy to have been blessed with such suffering, which is more than any Baggins deserves. Faced at the point of death with such wisdom, 
it is no wonder that Thorin responds that there is more good in Bilbo, a child of the kindly West, than the Hobbit realises. He has courage and wisdom in right measure and values food and cheer and song above hoarded gold. And here is the paradox at the heart of the Christian life. The one who embraces suffering, who dies to himself in order to die for others, is actually happier than the one who shuns suffering and who puts himself above all else. The most miserable people are those who are self-centred, whose friendships are phony and who value material possessions over spiritual wealth. For in truth, the cross cannot be avoided. Everybody carries his cross and the one who resents it is nailed more painfully to it than the one who embraces it in an act of love. This is the secret of Christ's words that his yoke is easy and his burden light. If we allow Christ to help us carry our cross, we will find the very sufferings of life a source of joy. If we refuse his help, we will be crushed under the weight of our sin's gravity. My dear Bilbo, something is the matter with you. You are not the hobbit that you were. The wizard, in his wisdom, perceives that the hobbit has grown. He had grown in moral stature. He had grown in wisdom. He had grown in virtue. In short, he had grown up. As Bilbo finally arrives home, more than a year after his departure, he is shocked to find that the contents of his home are being auctioned and that, indeed, most of his treasured belongings have already been sold for next to nothing. The auction was advertised as a sale of the property of the late Bilbo Baggins Esquire, who was presumed dead. One can imagine the reaction as Bilbo gate crashes his own funeral and declares in the words of Mark Twain that the reports of his death have been greatly exaggerated. The return of Mr. Bilbo Baggins created quite a disturbance, both under the hill and over the hill and across the water. The legal bother indeed lasted for years. It was quite a long time before Mr. Baggins was, in fact, admitted to be alive again. The people who had got specially good bargains at the sale took a deal of convincing, and in the end, to save time, Bilbo had to buy back quite a lot of his own furniture. We cannot see the death and resurrection of Bilbo at the story's end purely at face value. Returning to Gandalf's words, we can see that Bilbo is not the hobbit that he was. He had been dead before he set out on his adventure. His journey had changed him. It had brought him to life. It was the death of the old hobbit and the birth of the new. He had been born again. It was a baptism into a truer, fuller life. In this sense, the perception of his resurrection from the dead upon his return is only a literal recognition of a deeper spiritual reality. Bilbo had indeed been dead, but is now alive. The fact that Bilbo's resurrection is not accepted by those who are spiritually dead, such as the Sackville Bagginses and their ilk, who know the price of everything and the value of nothing, reminds us of those who refused to accept the resurrection of Christ after he rose from the dead and of the words of scripture in which Christ prophesied this rejection of his life. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if one rise again from the dead. 
Thus, Bilbo, in spite of the new life that is in him, is considered dead in the eyes of the world. We are told that he has lost much more than his spoons. He had lost his reputation. He was no longer quite respectable. The loss of such worldly reputation and worldly respectability means very little to the resurrected Bilbo. He no longer cares for such trifles. If he is dead in the eyes of the world, he is also dead to the world. He no longer seeks the things that the world has to offer, having discovered the pearl of great price that the world does not value. The stealing at the auction of the treasure from Bilbo's own kingdom, and let's not forget that a hobbit's home is his castle, reminds us of Bilbo's own role as a burglar who stole the treasure from the dragon. It is, however, an inversion of Bilbo's role and not a parallel with it, because Bilbo was not really a burglar or a thief and was only taken from the dragon that which the dragon had stolen from others. Furthermore, he did not take the treasure for himself, but to return it to its rightful owner. The parallel scenario, as distinct from its inversion, would be to see the sackful Bagginses and the other pillagers of Bilbo's possessions as images of Smaug, invading the kingdom of another, despoiling it, and seeking to claim it as their own. Another parallel scenario is to see Bilbo's return as a reflection of the return of the king. Like Thorin and Aragorn, though on a much smaller scale, as is appropriate for a hobbit, Bilbo returns to his kingdom to claim his true inheritance. If Thorin is the king under the mountain, Bilbo is the king under the hill. His home address being Bag End, Underhill, Hobbiton. His kingdom might be minuscule in relation to Thorin's or Aragorn's, but for a hobbit, that which is small is all the more beautiful for its smallness. Like Thorin, he faces his own dragons and frees his hobbit whole kingdom of their presence. His return is truly the return of the king and in the light of his resurrection, we can see the aptness of the phrase that is uttered upon the death of one monarch and the accession of his successor. The king is dead, long live the king. The old king of Bag End is indeed dead, long live the new king. The new king of Bag End rules his kingdom in a radically different way from the old king. Whereas the old Bilbo was very protective of his reputation and desired to be seen as respectable by his neighbours, we are told that the new Bilbo did not mind the loss of his reputation and respectability. He did not mind. He was quite content. And the sound of the kettle on his hearth was ever after more musical than it had been, even in the quiet days before the unexpected party. Home is sweeter for the absence. Everything is made new, even the smallest things, especially the smallest things, such as the kettle on the hearth. The new Bilbo sees the old things with new eyes, and he sees that they are good, indeed, better than he had ever imagined them to be. In the final conversation between Gandalf and Bilbo, with which the story concludes, Gandalf reminds the Hobbit that he is but a small part of a much bigger providential picture. You don't really suppose, do you, that all of your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck just for your sole benefit? You are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I am very fond of you. But you are only quite a little fellow in a wide world after all. <laughs> Thank goodness, said Bilbo, laughing, and handed him the tobacco jar. 
The final paradox, worthy of Chesterton or indeed of Jesus Christ, the latter of whom is the master of paradox as he is the master of everything else, is that the purpose of Bilbo's pilgrimage was to enable him to grow big enough to know how small he is. The greatest gift that Bilbo receives from all his adventures is the poverty of spirit which enables him to inherit the kingdom of the heaven haven of the home. And since every true home is but an image and prefigurement of the ultimate heaven haven for which we are all made, Bilbo's kingdom is closer than he realizes to the kingdom of God. At the end of The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins has not only learned how to live, he has learned how to live happily ever after. This is the most important happy ending, the happy ending with God in heaven. I'm Joseph Pierce. Thanks for joining me on Bilbo's Journey. The consolation of fairy stories, the joy of the happy ending, is one of the things which fairy stories can produce supremely well. In its fairy tale setting, it is a sudden and miraculous grace. It denies universal final defeat, and in so far is Evangelion, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world.